to the money show this evening it's good to have you with us uh, we've got chief executive standing by to talk to us this evening savros nikolao is a senior executive at aspen pharmacare catch up with him in just a moment on the promise of african produced vaccines johnson and johnson variety finally coming to market after months of delays we'll chat to the ceo of tiger brands tonight as well let's touch base on that story first this evening stavros nikolao aspen to release the first supplies of j and j vaccines with active ingredients this time stavros uh, released from Europe rather than the United States after that contamination incident, of course, of a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, Bruce, uh, good evening and good evening to all the listeners. Uh, I think this is quite a seminal moment. It's, it's an important milestone both for Aspen and for the country and the continent for that matter. So as you correctly point out, there were contamination issues. Uh, we were, in fact, ready to... We, we had produced product, as you know, uh, in March and April. Uh, this occasion, the delay, we had to get active substance or drug substance, as we call it, out of uh, Leiden in, in the Netherlands. This has now been converted. The stock, the final stock or finished stock, as we call it, is ready. Uh, Johnson & Johnson have taken receipt of it. It has been packed into these special vacuum containers and will be made available for release or shot in people's arms later on this week. So it is indeed a proud moment because this is the first African-produced COVID vaccine by an African com company for South African and African patients. But geez, it's taken a long time. I mean, so much longer than you would have anticipated when it was announced months and months and months ago. Bruce, it's actually, it's, you know, J&J &J have got nine contract manufacturers and in fact Aspen has been the quickest of the nine even though we were the second last to receive a technology transfer so we've put together a technology transfer that commenced in uh, in December and to have product out in July is, is actually a very it's a, it's a very speedy process I know it seems long because we're all going through the traumas of second and third waves etc but in, in real terms, it's actually been a very swift response. OK, good to hear on that particular front, Stavros. What about the volumes? I mean, how much is coming to market this week? So, Bruce, I think it's out in the, you know, in the public domain. It would ordinarily be for Johnson & Johnson to answer that because it's their stock and they're responsible for the distribution. But the, the health department has made this announcement. It's it's one just under 1.5 million doses, sure. um, and then there's a second consignment that would come about in early August as well. Okay, so I mean, how far away are you from your million doses a day production target? When this was first announced, I recall talking to Stephen Saad saying it'll start slowly, but the goal is a million doses a day. How far are you from that? Okay, so Bruce, look, we are getting into some cadence of the, uh, drug substance supply. So, of course, our capacity at Aspen is to make up to 25 million doses of J&J &J products on a monthly basis. So that's the capacity that we've got and we can certainly deliver. But our ability to deliver is dependent on getting the drug substance uh, out of Leiden now. So when we're in a full cadence of APR supply, then I think we will start hitting those numbers between 20 to 25 million. And of course, as you know, the president last night in his family meeting announced that all the production that gets uh, manufactured at, at Aspen's Kabeha facility from October onward will be exclusively for South Africa and the African continent. Good news indeed. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Dr. Sabros Nikolaou, Senior Executive responsible for trade development at, uh, at I was going to say Johnson & Johnson, at Aspen Pharmacare, manufacturing, of course, on behalf of J&J &J and getting vaccines to market. Interesting that they are among the faster movers in the world 
Um, yeah, we are often very, very hard on ourselves. Also hard on themselves, Tiger Brands recalling to more than 600 million rands worth of canned vegetables as a result of leaking tins. 20 million Koo and Hugo's canned vegetable products are being withdrawn over safety concerns. It's about 9% of total annual production. Chief Executive at Tiger Brands, Noel Doyle, is with us. Um, and it comes down to not that many cans affected that you've been able to trace so far, Noel, uh, but you can't be going through the same sort of trials and tribulations, of course, that you had in your meat processing plant a while back and all of the allegations uh, of, of food poisoning from that. So you're being extra cautious, it would seem. Well, good evening, Bruce, and good evening to your listeners. Bruce, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's probably a tiny, tiny amount of cans and as we, I think, have pointed out, you know, there's no evidence. We certainly haven't had any consumer complaints around uh, this issue, nor have we in our trade inspections found any of those sort of leaking cans out there. But at the end of the day, even a small number of cans times a small probability of contamination times a small probability that a consumer doesn't actually see it manifest when they open the product is is too high a probability when you look at the potential for for injury um, or, or damage to a consumer and that's why we've made uh, this decision what is the risk i mean i mean you've got leaking cans i suppose if stuff can get out of the cans bacteria and other bad things can get in that's absolutely right uh, bruce you know even though these are real sort of pinhole leaks the possibility of some kind of microbial contamination, depending on, you know, the circumstances in which the cans are stored. Um, and then almost all potential contaminants will manifest itself. The can would, would, would bloat and you would see that the can is out of shape or there would be a smell or, a, or a, 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 an appearance that, that looked unpleasant. Uh, but we can't guarantee that for all of the potential contaminants. And therefore, there still remains a very small residual risk, you know, that a, that a consumer could eat something and be harmed by it. And, and that's why we, we have to take this, this step. Do you destroy all of the recalled cans? Um, or can you go through manually and check each one and then release those that are safe for consumption back into market? Yeah, unfortunately, Bruce, at this point in time, what we, our first intention is just to get all the cans back then we are going to look at whether there's any technology available to us to assess the cans in terms of this specific uh, defect that we're talking about. If we can't do that, we will probably have to find a way to, to destroy the product because the challenge, as we've seen from our own sort of transport test, is a can that looks good today if it's got this specific cold well defect. If you transport it in the future, that defect may manifest itself in that leak. Um, and therefore, we can't take that chance. So what we have to try and do is to see if there is a way of identifying the cans. You know, X-ray technology, unfortunately, doesn't work well with a, with a can that's already full of product. So we are scouring the globe because it would obviously be, it would be a terrible thing to destroy, you know, food that is 99.999% safe. Uh, in a in a country that faces the challenges that we've got, but ultimately we have to make sure that uh, that we do the right thing by our consumers. And your tin supplier, your can supplier, I'm sure stiff emails have been uh, have been exchanged. Uh, look, I think it's it's fair to say you know we have a relationship with this uh, supplier going back a, a number of years, and and I have to say that they've been very open and transparent and our engagements so far have been non-legalistic in nature they've all been around jointly working to get to the bottom of the problem and to make sure that the steps that we take are the right steps for the for the consumers you know what happens uh, going forward you know would be conjecture but so far it's it's been nothing but a collegial partnership uh, relationship to solving the problem so no plans to can the can supplier just yet I think that's a fair comment, Bruce, yeah. Noel Doyle, thank you very much indeed. Chief Executive at Tiger Brands this evening, being super cautious. Uh, don't want to go down that particular slippery slope of contaminated food getting into the market. 
Not this time. Well, record profits and a record dividend for Anglo-American Platinum, which earned seven times more in the first six months of its current financial year than it did in the same period last year. Chief Executive Natasha Fulyun is with us on the line to us from Joburg this evening. And it has been an extraordinary six months, Natasha. You must wake up every single morning and looking at the prices and wondering just how long the good times can last. <laughs> Good afternoon, um, Bruce, and good afternoon to your listeners. Um, indeed, it has been a half of opposites of very highs and very lows, just very aware of the benefits that we as a broader society have that we can gain from the high prices, but also just reflecting on the very lows and the impacts in, on our country on our country and our employees and the COVID, third wave of COVID and the social unrest. So certainly the two things coming together. I mean, certainly, yes, the third wave of COVID has had a detrimental effect on absolutely every industry. The unrest has been uh, absolutely catastrophic. But I would argue that it would have been considerably worse had we not had the extraordinary taxes paid by the mining industry during this time and the export revenues generated by the mining industry, in particular, the Platinum Group Metals producers like yourselves, who have really helped the national balance of payments thanks to um, the high dollar prices your product has achieved internationally. Indeed, Bruce. I think um, we we often forget the benefits of having um, the, the mineral resources we have available in our country, significant capital investment from our shareholders. When we apply the two together, we do generate value for a broader society. And indeed, in this first half, we have uh, made a significant economic contribution to the value of just below 40 billion rand, of which 16.6 billion went straight into the fiscus in terms of taxes and royalties. But there was also a, a significant contribution directly to society through, um, through salaries and wages to the amount of 5.5 billion rand. Um, increased procurement for our local and doorstep communities of 2.2 billion in this half, significantly up from our spent last year. So, um, despite well, in addition to good financial returns, a balanced good um, mm. um, value creation for the broader society in South Africa. You pay a base dividend. You've also paid a special dividend that comes together to 100 and 75 rand per share. I think if my maths doesn't let me down, it's a 9% yield. Uh, I wonder whether or not the higher prices which have made this possible, and of course higher production, which you did, 28% higher production than this time last year. I wonder what you're thinking about the prices of the commodities you produce, the platinum group metals, that basket um, of metals, which is so diverse, yet all comes from the same source. Hmm. Um, yes, Bruce, and that was indeed 11% dividend yield. Um, 11, I beg your pardon. Um, I stand corrected and I've scribbled it down. It will be ingrained on my unmathematical brain forever. Sorry, I um, didn't want that to sound... Um, no, of course. Exactly no, no, you are absolutely um, right. I'm, 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 I'm chastised, 11%. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop doing calculations in my head and actually use what my cell phone was intended for, um, and that's the calculator function. But thank you for that correction, Natasha. Sorry. Uh, how long can the, the high prices be sustained? I think, Bruce, the, the prices that we've seen um, was definitely influenced by what we've seen over the last 18 months, Certain a very big uncertain time for us with um, through COVID first impacting um, demand and then shortly after that supply, we start to see demand coming back quite nicely. Um, and at the same time, when we get supply coming back, we continue to see an increase in um, legislation, it's the, um, environmental legislation that requires. The loadings on the autocatalytic converters, which is the highest consumer of our product, being um, we, we see a continuous increase. Um, for that reason, um, we do predict for the near term to continue to see a slight deficit in all three our main metals, platinum, palladium um, and rhodium. 
if we um, if we then consider we see the um, the change in the drivetrain, the electrification of the drivetrain, um, both with battery electric and fuel cell electric vehicles coming through, we offset any reduction in internal combustion engines with that increase in loadings. So for the near term, um, we are of the view that um, prices will remain robust. And if we predict a little bit further out um, into the medium term, um, we are actively working as a company in the um, in market development to ensure that where there's any risk to our product in that medium to long term, that we continue to work to develop markets for our products. What about wages? It's always a contentious issue in the mining industry, particularly in boom times like we're seeing at the moment, do workers get a share of the super profits, the super dividends that flow to to public investors? Um, Bruce, I think it's probably a couple of things to ways to think about this. For starters, we have, through this this entire period, um, continued to pay um, all of our workers, um, also the workers who were not able to come back to work due to um, being vulnerable, and the impact of COVID-19. I think from an operational point of view, important to point out that workers on a continuous basis um, get um, benefits from bonuses, from production bonuses that they are receiving on a, on a monthly basis. So there's, and then there's obviously the continuous opportunity, the con- making sure that we are sustainable as a business and that continued um, employment opportunity going forward. Because the last thing you want, of course, at a time where prices are as elevated as they are, to lose production if workers ever did get disgruntled with their share of the spoils. I mean, are you confident that your wage deals that you have got in place are sufficient to to carry you through this time of of elevated pricing? Um, we do have a wage agreement, Bruce, that um, is that will will go back to negotiations next year. And I think it's important for us to recognise that the commodities um, cycle goes through up and down cycles. And we've seen our cycle being down for quite some time. And it's not too far back that we remember times that we had to cut back, weren't able to, um, to pay dividends either. So I think if we look at a sustainable base load, and making sure that we continue cost that we continue that cost containment, it is important for us to consider the value contribution broader than just salaries and wages, but making sure that we set up our business in a way that we are sustainable through um, both the up and the down cycles in the commodity um, well in the in commodity pricing. Natasha Fulun, Chief Executive at Anglo American Platinum, one hundred and seventy five Rand a share in the money show. The markets. Not long ago, not long ago, as I make my point, Arthur Karras at the old mutual investment group, and not long ago that you would have paid 175 Rand a share for an Anglo Platinum share. I mean, probably a couple of years, but still, um, the dividend flow is extraordinary. Absolutely. And I think the point out here is that it's, um, it's more than 10%. For the dividend paid at the interim so that's just the half year yield you've still got the dividend for the second half of the year to come which will give you your yield for the full year but yes dramatic turnaround over the last few years for the platinum companies well and they're doing very well and they're making a massive contribution as well to the fiscus um it's surprising on a day like today that the market was practically flat by the end of trade the Chinese government announcing curbs, including banning companies that teach the, the school curricula for making a profit. Now, Process and Nuspers have got it, uh, got investments in the educational technology sector. Um, and uh, today they got bludgeoned. I mean, both Nuspers and Process down about 8%. Now, the, the investments that Process and Nuspers have in ed tech uh, is, is pretty much all outside of China. So that wouldn't have been affected for this. This regulation is really aimed at um, at preventing people from making a business out of tutoring school, um, high school and primary school students. So it's effectively at the stroke of a pen said these these are no longer for-profit businesses. Um, and it saw the, the, the share prices of, of, of the companies involved with for some 70% in, in one day. 
So, so most of the big Chinese conglom- uh, tech conglomerates, Tencent being one, and have some investment there. Um, but this is just a part of a, a, a steady flow of regulatory information. So the other thing that happened on the day is that the government has has also said that uh, Tencent Music may not um, may not do any offshore international acquisitions of music providers. Those that, that it has done, it needs to unwind. Um, it removed a whole lot of restrictions in terms of exclusive deals for music companies, and it expressly forbade Tencent from assisting Tencent Music two separate companies from becoming the number one player in the sector again. So it's a, it's a stream of, 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 of ongoing regulatory attempts that we, we can see from the Chinese government to limit um, the dominance of these companies across various industry sectors. And I think that is what the market is really coming to grips with now. And I mean, from an, uh, an investment point of view, um, does the investment case for the Nusbass and Tencent then still hold considering so much of the future was being priced on the huge business opportunity emanating from China and the rest of the world. So I would say that regulation has probably probably been at the top or close to the top of our list when looking at at, at the entire tech space. So that would include looking at, at the developed world tech companies like Amazon, um, Facebook, all facing increased um, regulatory scrutiny across a number of different things. The, 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 the tax um, accord that the, uh, that the G7 is trying to reach, that's one of those elements. But everyone's looking at these companies saying they pretty much came out of nowhere. We don't have rules to govern how they behave. So the, 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 the regulatory burden on these companies is set to get steadily higher. When it comes to the Chinese companies, and specifically Tencent, um, there, that it appears to have an additional impetus behind it because the Communist Party doesn't want anyone else to gain the kind of broad sweeping power that they have to influence people. So I, I think that that, the, 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 that started a few years ago. If you remember, there was a, um, a regu- they passed regulations limiting the amount of hours that, um, that young people could play computer games. But the really big shock came through last year when we saw. Um, the Chinese government just slapping down Alibaba, saying you may not list this company, you have to fulfill all these rules, you simply have to get in line. And um, while Tencent has much better um, relationship with with the government, they certainly uh, are are not going to escape from this. Okay, really interesting on that particular front. Tiger Brands sort of weighing up whether or not it can release its cans, its recalled cans back to market once it proves that they're safe for consumption. Um, that's a little bit uncomfortable, but not deathly. What could be deathly for many players in the liquor industry is lockdown after lockdown and ban after ban after ban. I wonder whether or not you're concerned at all for the sector. Very much so. I think that I think every additional lockdown puts puts businesses at risk. I would say the larger ones um, are, are, get, are, are in a better position to try and um, to try and manage their, their way through this. I think it's just a, the smaller businesses that are a worry. And while those businesses aren't listed, they do rely on, on you know, larger companies to supply them, to fund them, um, and, and they form part of the overall ecosystem, the whole food and beverage market. So definitely... The, the ongoing on and off there is, is bad for them. It's also um, it's, it's also affected uh, some of the packaging companies, um, especially those that run like uh, glass furnaces, where those things cannot be turned on and off. Um, so it's it's it had a negative impact on a whole bunch of industries. And I think that um, that notwithstanding that lockdown for now looks to be over, I think the impact on companies' balance sheets and the like will will, will still have an impact for a while. Thank you, Arthur Karras, Portfolio Manager of Macro Solutions at the Old Mutual Investment Group. Another story today, of course, is the fact that there's been a bit of a tax break given, to, well, a tax, wait, a, a, a tax pause given um, to the liquor industry. Seven and a half billion rands worth of excise will be paid in three months rather than immediately. And that's a piece of good news. Here's the problem, though, that the regular liquor bans have cost the South African fiscus something like 60 billion rand. 
And that comes with the addition of new grants, which are going to be very welcome, uh, being reinstated uh, to people who desperately need them, and particularly to mothers who were told they couldn't have two grants. Now they'll be able to get this extra 350 rand grant, which will be very, very welcome. Somehow it's going to have to get paid for, and the booze industry could have gone a long way in order to do that. But I think government's beginning to wake up to that reality now, too, as money runs very, very short. The Money Show with Bruce Whitfield is brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking. Collaborating with our clients in the pursuit of excellence. That's Africanacity. APSA is a registered FSP. Welcome to The Money Show. Good to have you with us this evening. I see somebody is complaining to Simply Asia about how dreadful the meal was that they had endured. And the sushi 6 out of 10, and the salmon roses... Uh, were, were, were more rice than salmon and the fried chicken was a complete disaster. Uh, to which Simply Asia so elegantly respond on social media to say um, you know, to this person, terribly sorry, but the picture is that uh, not our meal. So sorry, it's not our food. You really should come to us and enjoy some decent food. And the complainant has the grace to admit that they've made a terrible mistake and apologizes. Simply Asia says, hey, no problem. Give us your details and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll give you a meal on us. It's a really nice and elegant solution. I don't recommend that everybody now goes and posts food of that you've prepared at home and goes and tries to get away with the same thing with Simply Asia. I don't think they'll fall for that, not for a moment. But it is nice when brands get it right and um, they, they put consumers in their place nicely, sweetly, elegantly, um, but uh, in doing so, um, also make a friend in the process. It's really nice to see. On the next Money Show, Gary Boyson, he's a portfolio manager at Rand Swiss, returns as our headmaster of the investment school. He believes that there is a dark side to exchange-traded funds. This is something we must hear about. Looking forward to spending time with him. Also, the Africa Business Report and Andy Rice, our branding and advertising expert with heroes and zeros. That and all the other big money stories on the day, of course, coming up on the next Money Show. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. Well, matching foresight with sustainable possibility to unlock your business's potential. APSA Insights is brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking on 702 and Cape Talk. You don't just need data to keep track of trends that are shaping the economy. You need the expertise to join the, turn that data into valuable insights and sustainable growth opportunities. In the APSA Insights podcast series this month, I'm focusing on enterprise and supplier development. It's a lot more interesting than you might think. In the latest episode, I chat to David Mbaruza. He is the Head of Enterprise and Supply Chain Development at Corporate and Investment Banking at ABSA Group. And I asked him how we make sure that South Africa's small and medium-sized businesses get the help they need to become the large corporations of the future. I'm reluctant to use the term revolution because it has so many negative connotations, but there does appear to be something of a revolution, at least a revolution in thinking and in some cases in doing when it comes to the development of enterprise and supply chains. Absolutely. Bruce. Um, revolution, you know, we could argue about whether that's the right word or not, but there's certainly the right thinking that's happening around this. From a policy point of view, um, I think corporations are really you know, starting to relook at their role in terms of supporting the growth of the continent. Uh, financial institutions, like I mentioned, also looking at innovative ways of providing financing and, and, and non-traditional ways of providing that financing. And, and from a revolution point of view, we're actually finding in certain countries where you know, they've said, you know, for instance, X goods can only be supplied or manufactured or grown by a local entity. And that message even going through to some of the borders in, in terms of, well, if you see a truck coming from this country with a good that's supposed to be reserved for local manufacture or local procurement, you've got to send that truck back, right? So this is, you know, some of the, the right kind of thinking around, you know, revolution, which, which, which is actually going to get Africa into the right place. Catch my full chat with David Mbaruza, the Head of Enterprise and Supply Chain Development at uh, Corporate and Investment Banking at APSA Group on your favorite podcast app or on our website. Just look for the APSA Insights feature. 702. SMS Bruce. On 31702. So the South African Liquor Brand Owners Association, it's called Selba, 
We needed another acronym. Uh, it estimates that the four bans that have been imposed on the liquor industry and thereby on you and your ability to buy booze has hit South Africa's GDP by nearly 65 billion rand, or it's had a 1.3% knock on GDP. That is significant. Uh, Salba, welcoming the end of the fourth ban, says businesses need to be allowed to trade without the continual risk of another ban. They're getting very, very, very twitchy about this. Well, the liquor industry has been given in a 7.5 billion rand tax postponement. Will it, though, amount to anything significant, I wonder? Uh, Charles DeVette is tax executive at ENS Africa. He joins us on the line from the Western Cape this evening. Uh, Charles, I mean, 7.5 billion rand in tax postponements is great, but this industry has lost tens of billions more in revenues over that time, surely. Uh, good evening, Bruce. And yes, that's completely correct. I, mean, I think there's been significant loss in the uh, uh, of taxes in the process because of the the periods where nobody could could trade. And I mean, this is giving something back, but not very much because it's only cash flow. You know, it's not going to impact on on, on price. And I think it's an it, it, it's an acknowledgement to uh, to the liquor industry to to say that yes, we we know you've been hit hard by this, and we know that you've got a little bit of cash in the bank after. After a year long of of, of battling through COVID nineteen, so uh, you don't have to pay your tax first. You know, look after your people, get your stock sorted, uh, and you you can pay us in in, in three months' time. So, so I I, I don't see it's a big flow through the economy, but it will certainly it's an indication to the sector and help to the sector just for them to to, to stabilise things. Uh, and certainly from a government perspective. It's given up on huge swathes of revenue, it's huge swathes of revenue, revenue that is desperately needed to fund the additional grants which are necessary and which are going to be made available again, thank goodness. But government's got to get really a hell of a lot smarter, surely, about what it sacrifices when it wants to keep on spending. I, what we've seen since the beginning of this uh, fiscal year is the tax collections have actually not been too bad. So, you know, they, they are quite nicely up on uh, on last year. And I think that that is now, you know, g- given the, the, the minister and the president the opportunity to decide what to do that, I, I, I would guess they slightly uh, slightly above the budget. You know, we've, we've only got two months info to, uh, uh, to look at. So, you know, collections are important, but at the same time, without the economy going, going without us creating employment, it's going to be, I mean, very difficult to achieve the, the estimates that we're putting in the budget in, uh, uh, in February. So I think that, you know, because there's a little bit of, of, of extra cash around, um, th- this was a good opportunity to say, well, where uh, are, are the parts of the economy that need it most? And it certainly it was, in, in, you know, looking after... Uh, uh, people's livelihood and, 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 and on the ground side, and then you know the the site impetus in the in the liquor industry from a cash flow perspective, and then obviously the last thing was on PYE as well. They're happy to delay that slightly so that if people do have big liabilities, they can they can place that ahead of tax for a month or two. You've been watching the tax system now for I don't want to age you now, Charles, but I mean a quarter of a century, perhaps a little longer. Uh, the fiscus is massively strained um you know governments can spend 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 as long as they have income and you know yes we're having some wonderful boosts from the likes of anglo-american platinum and the work that uh, people like natasha for the chief executive there are doing um and that's great but at some point you start running out of luck um in terms of your revenue line we need to make a plan on revenue really really quickly without imposing further taxes on very stressed corporations and people. And, and, and that's exactly correct. I mean, you know, we, we, we are very highly ta- already are very highly taxed as a, as a country. I mean, our rates are high, you know, across the board. I mean, the last year we have seen sort of corporate rates across the world pick up uh, just a little bit. But we need that economic growth to uh, to do that because that is what drives the numbers. So, you know, so, so adjustments to maximum marginal rates, or you know, small adjustments to uh, to the company rate doesn't generate a significant amount of income. Why it has a very negative impact on settlement, and never, and never, you know, very negative impact on on the investment that companies are are prepared to make. It doesn't 
uh, generate enough revenue that we can that, that, that it is sustainable for the for the state to keep on spending. So you know we we, we need to grow the pie until we until we can do that with economic growth. It's, we are going to stay in a very strange position. Charles Devet, tax executive at ENS Africa. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. On to Tech with Toby this evening. Toby Shapshak is the publisher of Stuff magazine. These smart bands, are these things that sort of look like little rubber bands that not watches, but they what monitor your every thought and every desire, Toby. What are these smart bands exactly? Well, I don't know about my thoughts or my desires, Bruce, but they certainly monitor my steps. Um, like everyone else, you know, who's on Discovery, I like to <clears throat> do my 10,000 steps a day, you know, for my health purposes, not for anything else, obviously. Um, so I already wear an Apple Watch, and I've been experimenting with a variety of these Fitbit bands. I've tried um, the uh, Huawei Band 6. This is the Xiaomi Smart Band 6. Um, there's also the Honor, which is a sub-brand of Huawei Band 6. Um, so six is the number for the bands right now. Uh, I could probably make a s- pretty sad joke about six, six, six there. No, please don't. Um, but it's, <laughs> you know, I was, I was walking, I was walking uh, uh, through Amsterdam, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and I walked past a house that had a very prominent sign that said 667. So I took a photograph and I, I emailed it to a friend and went, the neighbor of the beast. Um, <laughs> Oh, I laughed at his joke, and then he disappeared. Toby, you with us? No, Toby disappeared. I tell you what, we'll get back. Oh, no, they, no, you're back now. You, uh, you, you see, you, you, you started making jokes about the beast, and you got cut off. I think we should stop there and move on to this nano espresso machine. This tiny little, is one of these dreadful little handheld espresso machines i saw a friend of mine wrestling with one at a weekend away recently and i just wondered what the point was you've got to be blooming desperate to get a cup of coffee out of one of those unless this one's better i don't know i mean i i'm looking for a good reason to to it's called a way coco nano express portable espresso maker it costs 1500 rand you can get it from take a lot uh, I don't know, Bruce. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I have this like absurd, like you know, uh, obsession with finding a really decent coffee maker. You know, we 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 had one for a while in staff offices. I remember Craig Wilson when he was the editor. You had to wind it and create pressure, and then there was another one you put in a booth. It just seems like the kind of the edge of 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 camping chic, right? You know, like camping, glam camping. Um, not that I do much camping at the moment. My son's four, but I'm sure we will soon. But nonetheless, uh, when the time comes for for us to go camping and me to have a portable coffee maker, I will have a... Not that I'm actually a big coffee drinker, it has to be said, but it just seems like one of those completely and utterly superfluous things that every man should own, Bruce. You know, like okay. a pair of felt <laughs> Uh, no, hey, I've got the felt's good. Uh, maybe the portable... Actually, no, I'll just give up on coffee until I come back. Just be grumpy instead. <laughs> now, there's a Samsung Galaxy yeah. A32. What is this thing? Is it a camera? Is it a computer? Is it's it a, a it's, phone? What is it? It's interesting, isn't it? So now, so now I'm very interested in what, what's kind of called the middle of the range, the middle of the market, the mid-range to low-end devices. And, I, and the reason is, is because... I think that's where most people are going to be able to afford it. Somewhere between 2,000 Rand and 5,000 Rand is what what the vast majority of people are going to be spending. So I look at these uh, category of phones, and I have to say Samsung's done a brilliant job with this Galaxy A32. It's got a 6.4-inch screen, right? So that's the same size screen as the iPhone 12 Pro I'm speaking to you on at the moment. It's got an AM OLED screen, which is better than the one I have, and and it refreshes at 90 hertz. You and I would not know that, but your teenage sons will know everything about the refresh rate of screens because it's very important for gamers. The better and faster the refresh rate, the better and smoother the video of the game. Why? Because people play games on their mobile phones. Now, the reason I heard you ask, is it a 
is it a is it a camera because uh, I mean it's, it's the primary sensor at the back is 24 uh, sorry 64 megapixels megapixels it's got an 8 megapixel ultra wide wide angle lens a 5 megapixel macro lens and then a 5 megapixel portrait lens that's just on the back and on the front the selfie camera is a 20 megapixel camera so now this is just a brilliant photographic device with decent memory. Samsung, very cleverly, you can put in a, an SD card so you can boost your memory. And you're getting a really great, and of course, the screen quality. Samsung makes these devices themselves. So I just think it's a really good quality phone with a Samsung brand for four and a half thousand Rand. I think it's a, I think it's a really good buy. And I, and I, and I think Samsung have done well with this Galaxy A range is astonishing it really is astonishing thank you for yeah, that Toby. i yeah. mean that that is is very useful for anybody who's wanting to a so-called upgrade i found the other day a sony ericsson phone a sony ericsson phone yes i think yes, it was a yes. three megapixel camera and that was phenomenal mm. then i know i know i remember i mean if you don't want to do anything with it i i have an archive of these old devices and i go through them just like you did and i and I marvel at what was once considered cutting edge, you know, and a couple of years later is just, you know, like, can you believe it? Three megapixels. I mean, I remember having a conversation no, Toby, Toby, Toby. with an executive. Let's, let's save the memories for next week, Toby. Let's save the memories. for. I love your memories, but just not right now. Toby Shapshak, Tech with Toby on a Monday night. Thank you, Toby. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. We'll talk about the property sector in just a moment. Liberty two degrees, seeing better occupancy coming through in shopping centres like Santon City and others. And uh, the company's paid out an interim dividend, which is a good sign. It's a sign of more positive things to come. Occupancy certainly are on the up, uh, which uh, from a year ago is incredibly good news. It also suggests there's a bit of activity in the economy. Also tonight's book, uh, business book tonight, it's, and it's not a business book. But it and and I've pulled rank here and I've abused my position because I really want to talk to Jane Evans, who's somebody I've known most of my life, and she started a revolution, and it's a revolution that we need to expand and we need to grow, and we need to develop. It's a very important revolution. It's one of these revolutions uh, that is pivotal for our future. And then, sadly, Miss Universe. Oh, she's talking to the United Nations this evening. Not available to us this evening. Apparently the United Nations is important. No, of course it's important. Maybe we will get uh, Zosibini uh, Tunzi one of these days again. Uh, but we'll bring you one of our favourite Make Money Mondays from about a year ago or thereabouts. Uh, we'll, we'll bring you that coming up at half past seven. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. Amelia Beatty is the Chief Executive of Liberty Two Degrees on the line to us from Johannesburg. Are your malls all up and running, Amelia, after the excitement of the last two or three weeks? Yeah, good evening, Bruce. Yes, they are all open. And after last night's announcement uh, from today on, they're trading their normal hours again. Okay, that's a piece of good news. How were you affected by the riots and disruption that hits KZN and, of course, parts of Gauteng? I don't think you were directly hit, but certainly there would have been a fair amount of trepidation over a period of a week or so. Yeah, it was a difficult time for our country, a difficult time for our colleagues in the property industry and for the tenants in our portfolio. Um, and really, um, we have a lot of uh, our thoughts go out to all those that have been impacted by it. We have been very um, grateful and thankful that we've had no direct damage. And the communities around our malls have been extraordinary, helping us to look after these, in addition to the really great security uh, initiatives that we have in place around our assets. Uh, it has exposed, I suppose, for want of a better word, the vulnerability of large shopping malls, of which you own many, um, across the country. I mean, it, it's you know we have seen without rapid state intervention how quickly things can go wrong. If the the security guards at the entrances to the shopping malls are not people who are designed to cope with forced entry on the scale um, that we saw over over the last couple of weeks. 
That's right, Bruce. And I think, you know, we've all been challenged by this. But the large super regionals, I think, is slightly more difficult to get into. Uh, they have got larger security complements. And it's really the strip malls, convenience centers, and the smaller malls that, that are more exposed. But we all need to remain on high alert, make sure that we keep our environments as safe as we possibly can so that we can get customers back into these malls um, so to grow the economy, to help our tenants and to move forward. I mean, far less paper over the windows in shopping malls as I, I mean, I haven't been to many in for a while now, but occasionally uh, pop into one briefly. Uh, and there's not too much brown paper on windows, which I think is a positive sign. And that comes through in your occupancy rate, sitting at nearly 97%. Yeah, I think a 3% vacancy rate or 97% occupancy in a time like this is the best uh, evidence we have to offer for any argument that retail is dead or super regional malls are dead. It's not how I feel or what the perception is. It's a fact. There's demand for this space and we are very pleased with our relationships with tenants that we could get uh, to continue to trade in our malls and new tenants like the new Adidas store, Chanel, and these um, new offerings that we can bring into our environment. What's happening to square meter rates? I mean, are these, um, are you still seeing inflationary increases? Have you had to freeze uh, increases? Where, are you, where do you sit? Over the last year, we have spent uh, significant time and effort in assisting our tenants. We have a strong balance sheet and we were in a, pos in a position to do that. And um, we have seen our reversion rates as the renewals come up to come under pressure and they have been negative this year. We anticipate that it's still be ne it will still be negative to the end of the year because COVID-19 impact is not going to be over immediately. The tenants will continue to feel it. But the important thing is that the cost of a vacancy is much higher than the cost of a slightly lower rental keeping a tenant in there. So we have been focused on keeping our malls full, bringing people back. Our foot count in May was up on 2019 foot count. Our turnover was up on 2019, May 2019 turnover. And I think that's an incredibly good sign. So our malls bounce back quickly and uh, we look forward to that recovery starting to come through. What's the status of the mom and pop shop? I think you know what I'm referring to, sort of the individually owned businesses, which have gradually left the sort of malls that you guys have been uh, running. And you, you mentioned the, the tenants of Adidas and Chanel, which are lovely to have. For many of us, though, we miss the small stores. We miss the mom and pop shops. Um, are you seeing a further deterioration in that part of the economy? We still have a lot of those in our malls and it's so important to have them because, yes, the upmarket stores are needed, but these mom and pop stores are what's bringing variety. They have been loyal to these malls for 40 years. Some of them have been trading there as families for that long. Those families have been impacted by COVID um, and we have assisted them as far as we could. Most of our rental re uh, relief over the last year have been to the SMEs and we support them 100% during this period. So they remain part of our plan. They remain part of the community that we are trying to create and they are very welcome in our environment and will continue to be into the future. And then finally, um, offices and office occupancies. You're above the industry sort of benchmark of 85%, you're sitting at 86.5%. Um, it's below where you were in December. Um, there was this time last year, every website you opened in any corner of the globe predicting the death of the office that was going to be the end. And I think we've grown up since then to realize that offices will continue to exist, but they're going to be very different. The size and scale and quality of the office space are going to be very different into the future. What's your experience? Yeah, um, we are fortunate that offices are a small part of our portfolio and our vacancies are mostly on top of Stanton City and Nelson Mandela Square where we have small pockets of space that we are offering. So it's not large users that when they leave, there's nobody left. 
But we believe that people need to get back to the offices, the mental well-being and the impact on the development of the leaders of tomorrow are so important for us to be all together, to collaborate, to be in the office with some flexibility that we learn can work during this time. So I think it will be different and we look forward to taking our people back to the offices and welcoming our tenants back there. Amelia Beatty, the Liberty Two Degrees Chief Executive. They own, amongst other properties, Santon City. Uh, of course, it's an, a huge sprawling mall, one of the very first built in the middle of the felt by Liberty all of those years ago. It must be 50 years ago. Is it 50 years ago? Could be 50 years ago. Uh, by the great Donny Gordon, of course. People remember him for his vision, foresight and courage. Um, and then Nelson Mandela Square next door, of course, also another flagship property uh, owned by Liberty Two Degrees. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. A colleague on Cape Talk, Lester Kivett, reminds us today on his Twitter feed that it is six years ago today. Six years ago today, that those twits at Encanta went and plugged in fire hoses into the luxury swimming pool and started pumping water into the air and tried to convince the world <laughs> that that was a fire pool, the most inefficient water storage mechanism for anybody wanting to keep water for a fire. But my goodness gracious me, six years ago. It feels like a million years ago. Only six years ago. Tonight's book, not a business book. It's, it's much better than that. It's about the creation of a non-profit organization that has helped shape rural child development in South Africa for the past four decades. Now, I've known Jane Evans most of my life. She arrived on a farm in the Free State, having left the Rand Daddy Mail, where she was the women's editor. And then she needed a mission. She needed a plan. She's written a book called A Path Unexpected, and it's all about Ntata Ise, which is a non-profit organization, which you found it, was it, night, you, you arrived in Fulyunskruen, must have been a, a huge culture shock, Jane, in 1978, um, and you needed a mission, I think, after working in the cut and thrust of the Rand Daily Mail and the madness of media in the apartheid era, you needed a, you needed a mission. I needed a mission, hello, Bruce, it's lovely be on air with you. I needed a mission, but the mission somehow came to me and found me before I was sort of too actively looking for it. And it probably all started with June 76 and the realization of what there was and wasn't in terms of education in our part of the world. And early childhood development was not a focus of apartheid South Africa. I mean, the Nats did fund farm schools um, and it was elementary education and kids used to walk along gravel roads for four or five kilometers to get to their nearest farm school. Um, but yeah. early childhood development wasn't a thing. It, you know, there were, I didn't go to nursery school and I think it shows, but um, I, I had a mum who, <laughs> who, who, who taught me, you know, who taught me what I needed to know that I would have learned at nursery school. Uh, but it, it was a case of early childhood development was a gap that, that you spotted. What, was, what influenced you to realize and understand that early childhood development was severely lacking in the preschool sector? You know, when I, when I worked on the Round Daily Mail, I did interviews with some fabulous women in Johannesburg, Dawn Haggy and Denise Parkinson, who worked with fantastic women in Soweto to try and make early learning a reality. I mean, I'm talking about the early 1970s, and with me it was 1976. And when the day on the 17th of June, when my husband and, aunt and I went down to the farm primary school, I left the two men to talk, the headmaster and Anthony, and I wandered off and saw lots and lots of little children just playing in the sand, pushing wire cars around. And I suddenly, I suppose something must have clicked, and I must have thought back to those, that my first visit to the Soweto preschools when I was 17, and I just said to Anthony on the way home, I asked the headmaster if there was any such thing as a nursery school for farm workers' children. And he said, no, absolutely not. He hadn't heard of anything of the sort, certainly not in our area, not in our province. And 
I just said to Anne on the way home, if the government isn't going to do it, then we're going to do it. And he said to me with an element of surprise, you know, what do you know about nursery schools? And I said, well, I don't, but I know people who do. And that's really where we left off from. But, but that's the point, and I think it's the lesson, I mean, the thing that comes through most strongly in the book is you really don't have a clue. You haven't an idea what you're doing, but you go and you do it anyway, and you're willing to go trial and error um, and, and to really build something that fundamentally changes the lives of probably by now millions of young people in South Africa. I mean, that is the extent of the reach of Ntata uh, uh to this day. Uh, those early days, I mean, did you ever sort of want to chuck in the towel if you looked at it and it just no. seemed hopeless as you made mistakes as you went along? It never occurred to me. You know, I was, I was extremely fortunate. There were the most wonderful women on the farm, farm workers' wives, young women, a few teachers, and we worked together from the word go. You know, I had very wise advice from my husband, Anthony, who, you know, said, look, it might be your bright idea, but you'd better find out if the parents of the children actually want such a thing. And really from that moment, I started asking. I didn't ever do anything without consulting. And when I did, I usually got myself into trouble. And I built up a really strong relationship with women on the farm, women in the township, women just generally there were women in those days. And I was looking at the title of your book and we found ourselves looking at the upside of Darwin in our in our time. Um, so I never worked alone and we it was trial and error from both our sides. Yet, I mean, you, when you opened on the farm, Hunter's Flay, which is the family farm, the Evans family farm, you, you know, on the first day, you had no idea if the kids would turn up. You you had consulted, you'd had the no. discussions. There was some apprehension. Um, and, and, and it was a bit touch and go, it seemed, at, at some points. It, it, you know, it was. There was lots of apprehension. Nobody was particularly convinced about children learning at that age. They... They, they only learned parents felt when they grew up. But food was going to be served. And I, it, it was obvious that the greatest need round about was food. It wasn't early learning. So that was fine. If we managed to get children there and we were obviously going to feed them, maybe two needs would be met at the same time. And as we know now, and I'm sure you probably knew then and certainly approved it back then, how important nutrition is in brain development, for goodness sake. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, so many kids in South Africa go to bed hungry and as a result, their little brains don't develop and they don't, you know, end up having the cognitive ability that they should have by the yeah. time they get into the schooling system. Yeah, Bruce, I think it's absolutely tragic. And I think this is one of the things of COVID. It is so many of the nursery schools, I would talk about the others, but haven't been functioning and parents have lost their jobs. They haven't been able to pay the fees. And kids have been hungry, so it's been an incredible effort on the part of a lot of the Insata ISO staff and the other network members we work with who've made every single effort they can to find food and to join in donations and to sort of help over the really tough months that we've had behind us. Uh, I mean, when, when I look at Ntatis and I look at its the, the extraordinary spread, it started slowly. Um, Hunter's Flay was the sort of proving ground. You made mistakes, yeah. but you got global interest. You got big funders. You got family officers. You got the British ambassador. You got so many people coming to see what you were doing. Jonathan Janssen was telling me the other day um, that you know he arrived from the United States after um, teaching there, and he just found these two people. He said, "Doing God's work." That's so quote unquote, um, and it was just astounded by by what you did. And gradually, you started finding getting inquiries from across the country, and this network spread. And when I last checked, there was something like uh, there were forty operations across the country. It's an extraordinary spread of, of, of yeah, preschool we've, education. We've, we've got about twenty two organisations, but they reach a lot of preschools. They've trained a lot of women. And it's, um, yeah, you know, we started small. 
and we had to learn along the way as we got more and more requests. We, you know, accepted with alacrity, but having accepted, you then had to work out how you were going to (laughs) assist people. And, um, you know, we just did and developed a model. And when we found we couldn't manage it ourselves, we being the Bullionskron-based organization, one just adapted the other organizations. And in fact, it was Jonathan Janssen and um, a colleague of his who came to visit us from USAID, who had been, which had been giving us quite a lot of money, and they, a woman called Jennifer Bisgard, and they said to us the next morning before they left, I was terrified they were going to say, look, we funded you and that's it. They said, is there anything else you need funding for? And I was able to say, we've got eight organizations in different provinces they want to become independent. It's becoming incredibly difficult to manage things in the far reaches of vendor from here, from the free state. And if you could make funds available to let us encourage and work with those organizations to become independent, form their own trusts, raise their own money, it would be fantastic. So that's what happened in the mid-80s. And, yeah, so today they're... 22 organizations doing similar work to us and using our training and we work as a very strong group. We're one of the strongest networks, I think, of our sort in the country. Um, And Uh, it brings us all tremendous joy and support to know that we've all got each other if we need assistance. I I wonder what you see as your biggest victory um, over the last... I mean, I don't keep wanting to emphasize 40 years, but it has been 40 years. Um, it's been 40 uh, years. What the biggest victory is, is it early childhood development, which is enormous? Is it the empowerment no. of women in a very, very yes. real sense and the dignity yeah. brought and drawing yes. people's innate ability? You were taking uneducated people and saying to them, Here's an opportunity, and these women grabbing with both hands, one because it was something valuable to do, but also just this sense of purpose and pride, which comes through in the book as almost a, at least a parallel success story. Bruce, that's been my greatest, um, if anyone says to me what has given me the greatest, joy is not the right word, but that for me has been the biggest thing, is we set out to provide nursery schools for children, but we turned into an incredible women's empowerment organization. And as you say, women who always felt they couldn't suddenly became women who could. And they're they're women who've achieved fantastic positions in their own communities, in the broader community, some in government, some have gone on to be teachers to get university qualifications. So if there's one thing that gives me incredible, I'm incredibly pleased I've been able to be part of it, was helping and being part of the empowerment of so many women from so many different backgrounds. You know, Jane, I grew up listening to stories about Jane Evans and Ntata Ise and seeing the work that you did. And I'm ashamed to say I had no idea just how big it was. It's an extraordinary story, Jane, and I'm so glad that you took the time to write it down and your children forced you to write it down um, because (laughs) I I think that there's so many lessons beyond the personal memoir that it is. Um, And um, I'm very grateful for you to make time with us this evening. Jane Evans, uh, A Path Unexpected. It's a story about Ntate Yise. It is a wonderful organization that has reached hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young people, but also the, the, the enormous empowerment of rural women through this process is nothing short of extraordinary. Um, and I am completely and utterly in awe of what um, Jane has achieved over that time. And the book is about a sense of purpose and a sense of like, well, I have a clue what I'm doing, but I know this is the right thing to do and just doing it. And there's so much that all of us can learn from that approach. 
And her late husband, Anthony, was a remarkable individual as well. At one time, he was a director at Standard Bank and he was a director of the Hudson Marensky Trust and many other things. But, I mean, she'd go to him with a problem and he'd go, so what do you want to do about it? And he would just basically, I mean, it was very useful support and, and you know, would pick up the phone occasionally. But again, complete faith in her ability to make it happen. And she did. The book is called A Path Unexpected. The author is Jane Evans. It is in bookshops. It is on Take A Lot. Uh, and it is magnificent. The Money Show with Bruce Whitfield is brought to you by Absol Corporate and Investment Banking. Collaborating with our clients in the pursuit of excellence. That's Africanacity. Apps is a registered FSP. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. One of the best things about hosting The Money Show is that we draw some of the most remarkable people from around the world as guests. And Miss Universe was going to talk to us tonight, but the trouble with you know having the world's most wonderful people <laughs> on the show is occasionally they get called to higher service. Not in that way, but they get called to do very important jobs. And so uh, Miss Universe this evening, uh, she's an, moderating an event for UN Women this evening. She's needed from half past seven till nine o'clock. So Zosibin Zetunzi is, unfortunately, Zosibin Zetunzi is not available for us tonight. So hopefully we'll get hold of her in the not too distant future. In the meantime, however, do not be dismayed. Do not be concerned because we do have Another guest that we spoke to a while back, you may have missed it, and even if you didn't, it was still a cool interview to do. This from the archive, the Money Show's extensive archive, ANC former NEC member, businessman, Saki Matozoma, and I asked him about his businesses and how they've been affected at that stage by COVID-19 and hard lockdowns. We, we have survived, and fortunately, we're not in some of the industries that were the hardest, hardest hit. Our business, biggest business now is um, uh, mining, which is uh, mining manganese and we sell manganese uh, to the Chinese market and, and other markets. Um, it was not affected uh, as much as because it's an open pit mine. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it is very dependent on the growth of the Chinese uh, uh, market, particularly so far as steel and steel related products are concerned. Um, so we had a, uh, contrary to what we had expected, we had the prices going up uh, as China was reopening because stocks were low. And of course, once the stock started coming in from South Africa and Australia and Ghana and other manganese producing um, areas, uh, the price started to trend down, but it is still within tolerable levels. Um, how's, what's your sense of the country's politics at the moment? I think I share the frustrations of many of many South Africans, uh, including uh, those who are in the political arena themselves. Because sometimes we we tend to think that the people who worry and are concerned are only those of us who are outside of the uh, uh, formal structured uh, uh, politics. But in my experience in interacting with people, even those who are uh, in positions uh, in the uh, structured uh, political organizations and, and, and government are as concerned as, as many of us are. The, the question is, how do we change the situation? That is, mm -hmm. that is a, a very difficult question. Some people are arguing, and I'm amongst one of those, that probably what is required is to change the, the electoral system. Because with this kind of electoral system we have, where people choose a party as opposed to uh, to the individuals they may believe in, they, one of the consequences, unintended consequences, is that party loyalty or loyalty to the tradition uh, and the history of a party becomes more uh, primary than um, who is actually qualified to govern at this point in time. Do you, do you still feel close to the ANC? Is the ANC still your home? If you don't mind being, being that impertinent to ask you that question. I think it's important, though, um, as many people's loyalties are things, I think, are being questioned at the moment. It, it's impossible not to feel uh, uh, the ANC as close to your home. I, I spent most of my life uh, uh, working for the ANC in, in, uh, as, you know, as, a, as a person. 
And I don't believe that there is anything wrong with the policies of the AC. This is precisely why it's, it's very difficult to come up with uh, an opposition. I think what is what it is a problem is the politicians and the people who have volunteered to become uh, leaders of our politi- of, of the of, of the ANC in particular and other political movements. Uh, uh, that is the issue, and and therefore I can't find uh, anything that could be a, a substitute for the ANC in terms of its intended policies. <laughs> but in terms of its impl- of the impl- of the implementation of those policies, and of course the whole the theft and the, um, you know which uh, makes me fume and I think makes a lot of South Africans fume, the theft is actually the the, the real problem. Whether the ANC will ever be able to overcome those is a is a is a question for debate. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard, Saki, to? Push back against the wholesale looting. I mean, the shameless looting that we see on a daily basis, even now with COVID-19 ravaging communities and society and the economy. There are charlatans and opportunists who just, you know, cannot wait for every opportunity to, to help themselves, no matter how deep the, the personal suffering they may cause. I think part of the problem is that uh, it's become endemic. Um, and therefore, even how, well, I, I suppose that the most other imp- important thing uh, is the factionalism in the in the in the in the ANC, in the sense that uh, when a leader, at whatever level, from the presidency to the branch chairman, when a leader needs uh, to be elected into a position, they have to come into alliances with uh, all kinds of uh, creepy crawlies, as I call them. And then what happens is that they then turn around to have to reward these people by giving them positions uh, in the in in the structure, whether they have the skills or whether they have the proclivity and the potential to steal. You have to defend your your faction, so to say. And I can't. When I look at the ANC, there are various sections. There are two big factions. There are many other factions at, at local level. And and, and, they, and this is this is what happens. Uh, and therefore. They really can't address this thing as robustly as they know they should do. I believe that uh, President uh, Ramaphosa has the intention and the will uh, to uh, to deal with uh, corruption. But the fact of the matter is that some of the people who, who put him into office are some of the people who are actually leading the, um, the looting. Uh, and to deal with them politically as an organization is very, very difficult. And I feel sorry, for instance, for people like uh, David Makura, who I know as a as a as a as a, as a person, uh, is not aligned to, um, uh, to to corruption, but to deal with the kinds of cumbersome structures of a divided political organization, is a political reality that they have to deal with. So tell me about growing up. I mean, we know that you went to prison as a youngster, as a 19-year-old. I mean, you were a, a leader of the student protest movement. You were sentenced to five years on Robben Island. You were there until 1982. Um, what did you, I mean, was it all politics between 1982 and, and, and 1994? Or did you do paid work in that time? What was What was your economic status in those days? I came out of Robben Island in 1982 and uh, went back home to Port Elizabeth. And I applied for a, an apprenticeship job at Ford Motor Company, which is a walking distance from my home. And I got a response that said, well, we, we, th- we think you're interesting. However, if you decide to emigrate to South Africa, you, we, we will consider you. And the reason why they said that is that all black South Africans in that part of the world were considered to be either citizens of the trans guy yeah. or citizens of the sky. And, um, and so I didn't, I, I didn't, I, I gave up the idea of getting a job in the private sector. Um, I, as I was giving up that idea, I got a, a job in a company called Blasting and Excavating, which was building a road uh, in the township, but also was building the bridges uh, in the Southern Cape on the N2. Okay. Um, and I was given a job as a soils analyst uh, and earning 400 rand a month uh, to analyze the soil for compaction purposes and that kind of thing. Within a month, the, police, the security police were there to say, you cannot 
employ a person like this and therefore we can't can't be sure you know, so i lost my job my, my first job after Rob and then i went to work for the uh, east cape council of churches and from there i got a scholarship uh, to go to study in the us and, and left uh, in 83 and came back in 86. Okay. then i went continued to work for the council of churches with uh, archbishop tutu and bears not and frank chicana became a bomb and those people um, um until the ANC was unbanned and I went to work for the ANC uh, on loan from the SACC and never came back to the SACC. <laughs> Do you miss the church? I don't miss the church in the sense that I'm still very connected uh, to it by, to, to my own church, the Anglican church, uh -huh. uh, as well as um, a lot of people that I have uh, known in the years that I worked uh, for the church. Yeah. Saki Matozoma. He has had many corporate roles, of course, but we're learning a little bit about his background. He is our uh, archive guest on Other People's Money. More with him in a moment. The Money Show with Bruce Whitfield is brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking. Collaborating with our clients in the pursuit of excellence. That's Africanacity. APSA is a registered FSP. You're with Bruce Whitfield on 702. Let's walk the talk. We promised you Miss Universe. Miss Universe has been called to host a panel discussion for UN women. So we gave her a pass and we went into our archives and got hold of an interview that we did last year with Saki Matozoma, who is the chair of Vodacom. He is also, of course, uh, the chair of Safika Holdings. And I asked him whether or not money is important to him. Yeah, I, I put it different and say money is a medium we need um, uh, in order to facilitate um, uh, activities um, of various kinds, economic and, um, and just living. But I think it's when we elevate it to a point where it becomes the thing that we worship, that... Uh, um, it, it, it becomes a problem because there, there's always this uh, issue about the, 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 you know, people say money is a root of all evil. Uh, the, you know, I can't remember what part of the Bible says that, but in reality, what that uh, uh, extract from the Bible says, it says the love of money yeah. is a root of all evil. And, and I think making a distinction between uh, that, I personally take a view, and when I speak to even to younger people, is that you don't get up every day from your bed and say i'm going to work i'm going to make money you get up to say i'm going to work and i'm going to do the best that i can uh, within the context of uh, of uh, the business that i'm in uh, and money is a, is a reward of uh, of doing your best uh, obviously if you in a public company you 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 are using other people's money and they put their money in there for a return uh, and if you don't believe in that, you should not be in that kind of business. Uh, but I would say that if ever I found myself in a business where money was like, um, somebody said to me about the mining industry in the, in the past, he said, uh, you, you send people uh, da down a mine and you say every day, you, you say to yourself, um, let's go and make money and dig uh, uh, some mineral and in the process we'll kill a few people. I would never want to find myself in, a, in that kind of business where uh, human life and dignity and everything else is subordinated to money. Are you any good at managing your own money? I mean, you've worked in the corporate sector. You've had access to some of the best brains in the money industry. Do you outsource it all? Do you actively participate? How do you manage the makos or my money, the legacy? I, I accept that uh, I'm not... This is not my uh, area of, of, of expertise. So I, I saw some of uh, many of the day-to-day decision-making by the share and sell that share uh, to people uh, to whom this is a profession. Because also you need to, to have the detail and time to be able to, to do that. But insofar as medium to longer term investment, I do uh, uh, take an, an active uh, interest but still do that uh, with people who are much better equipped uh, to do that than i am 
Um, and when you, you look at money decisions, I mean, we've all made mistakes. We've all, some of us made bigger personal money mistakes than others. Have you sort of, do you look back on um, 20, 30 years of, of work and investing and go, eh, could have done that better? Or oh, many. I, I think anybody who uh, can look back and say, I could have done that better, um, probably didn't do much uh, in that period. But I, I take a, a, I use a, a simple example, though, that if I go and buy a pair of shoes and I make a decision on the pair of shoes, I buy the pair of shoes and I go home, I don't go about window shopping again to see if there is another better f- pair of shoes in the, in the, in the mall. Because you could, you could, uh, um, you could, you could uh, uh, not find your way forward. I was looking mm-hmm. for a better word for that. Not find your way forward if you keep looking back, if you keep looking in the rear view mirror. But what uh, uh, I think is important is to remember the mistakes that you've made uh, and to make sure that uh, they don't, you don't repeat those. Uh, but also n- not make them uh, disable you from taking uh, uh, decisions in the future because the, the past is the past. You can, in the majority of cases, you cannot undo. Um, so you learn from it, but you, you look forward. What's been your most embarrassing money mistake? Come on, you can tell us. I th- I think my most embarrassing money mistake is is not investing in in something that that uh, somebody brought to me and said, look, we can it can make money in this thing in this way and this way, and then me saying, it sounds too good to be true. But I take a view also that um, even in those kinds of instances, uh, you have you have to accept that you will win some and you will lose some, and so I don't I don't fret about that uh, for too long. So you're not going to tell us what the biggest missed opportunity was. Unfortunately, yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> okay, then you then you've got to tell us your 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 biggest money mistake. I mean, or, or maybe your 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 darkest money habit. I mean, do you like expensive wine? You certainly like shoes. It would seem. I mean, do you do you have any bad <laughs> money habits? I well, I like uh, I like wine. I buy wine. I buy uh, books, but but books. And music are probably my greatest uh, uh, personal item expenditure. Um, but it's changing in a bit because now instead of buying CDs and buying online, but still uh, books and music are, are things that, uh, I, in fact, I've run out of space uh, for, for those kinds of things. <laughs> so that's where those are the things that I, I overindulge in, I think. Are, are you happy to stream music? Or travel do travel is another one. Unfortunately, it's not... Uh, I was going to say travel is another one, mm. um, but I justify that to myself that A, it's uh, therapeutic, B, uh, it is educational because I learn so much when I travel, say, at Vietnam or Thailand or China or some other country. Do you stream music or do you want to own it? I mean, because nowadays it feels like we don't need to own too much stuff. We can go to the book and <coughs> uh, the library and borrow a book. We can stream our music. We can... Uh, rent holiday places. We don't necessarily need to own the holiday places. What, what's your view? Well, let's start with holiday places. I, I, I grew up in a four-room house in Guazacan in, in Port Elizabeth. And I think I've got a, a, a fetish with space. Yeah. And um, at this th- stage, I should be thinking about downsizing, but I can't find, I can't think myself... Uh, living in a flat again, you know, uh, in, in that mix, I should show the cell I, I occupied for five years on, on, on Robin Island. So I, I tend to to want to ha- have a place that I own. But on the other hand, um, I, I've come to understand that it's not practical to have a, a space in, in, everywhere in the in, everywhere in the world. For music, I'm now probably halfway in my transition from CDs to um, buying online. I'm not streaming as much as I do because as somebody who travels, I'd like to have my music in my okay. on my phone or on my iPad or something so that if I'm traveling, it's, it's accessible because um, it's, it's not that easy when you travel uh, uh, to, to have the music easily accessible. But I think I am maybe even more 75% towards... Uh, uh, finding music in the, in, in, the, um, in the internet rather than buying physical stuff. 
Saki Matrazoma on other people's money from about 12 months ago. We were meant to be speaking to Miss Universe this evening, but she was called away to another meeting with the United Nations. So we gave her the night off and instead went into the archives and drew out Saki Matrozoma, the chairman of Safika Holdings of the Board of Vodacom and many others, uh, on giving us some insights into the mind of somebody who's made a bob or two in his own right in the last 30 years in South Africa. Also some really interesting discussions around politics and what's what many of those views actually haven't dated at all from 12 months ago. The Money Show with Bruce Whitfield is brought to you by APSA Corporate and Investment Banking. Collaborating with our clients in the pursuit of excellence. That's Africanacity. APSA is a registered FSP. SP. 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 SP.